The Holy Gospel for this Easter Sunday is a reading from St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, we're glad that you're here this uh, Easter Sunday to celebrate this great hope that is ours in Jesus Christ, in the good news of Easter, the good news that Jesus is risen. We're glad that you've uh, gathered here to be together with your family and also to be together with uh, the family of faith here at Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, this is the time when we remember the hope that is ours. This is the time that we remember the hope that we have for each other. This is the time that we remember the hope that God has for us. Now when you're in school, when you're in school and towards the end of a, maybe a long semester and you're in school and maybe you're getting towards the end of a long class period and, and the students are getting kind of restless, they're, they're maybe getting a little bored uh, on information overload from their teacher, and that teacher just keeps droning on and on and on and on, and a question will emerge from the students' minds. Sometimes they'll ask this question aloud, does anybody know what that question might be? Do we need to know this stuff, right? Are we going to be tested on this stuff? I mean, what is, it, what is it that we really have to know? What is it that maybe we just let slip by? Do I actually have to know this? And every once in a while, if you, if you have a great teacher, they'll tell you. They'll tell you what you need to know, what's going to be on that final exam. How many of you have ever find your minds wandering while someone is speaking? You don't really remember what the question was. You certainly don't even remember what the answer is. And that's okay. That's okay because God knows that this kind of stuff goes on. God knows that our minds wander. And so on Easter Sunday... Maybe when our minds are wandering, maybe even when our souls are wandering, we get this statement about our faith. We get kind of this executive kind of uh, summary of our faith. I mean, there's a lot to know about faith. There's a lot to know about how we live our lives in faith. There's a lot of information that comes to us, but what's essential What's the main thing? What's the core of it? What's the essence of it? What's the end of it? What's the purpose of it? What's the objective? What's the goal? What's the main point of our faith? Well, we get this in the Easter proclamation. We find this in the end of Easter, the purpose of Easter. And the first foundational thing about the Easter proclamation is that Christ has died. That's important for us to know. And this isn't difficult for us to know. This certainly isn't even difficult for us to remember. We know all about death because death is real for us. The Bible tells us that among those who tended to Jesus' body 
were two Marys, and they were there to prepare Jesus' body for burial. They were there to clean the blood from His body. They were there to clean the blood from His hair. They were there to close His eyes. They were there to touch His face. They were there to give Him one more measure and sign of the love that they had for Jesus. So they were there, these two Marys, the last to leave Calvary and the first to arrive at the grave. The feet that walked on water had been pierced. The hands that had healed so many had been stilled. So early on that Sunday morning, they were engaged in only one encounter, and that was an encounter with death. They knew about death. Death was real for them. And remember, at that time, they didn't know that this was the first Easter. They did not know what you and I know. They believed in death on that early Sunday morning. And so that's the first foundational truth for us, is that there is death and death is real. And we believe not only in the eventual death of our bodies, but we also uh, believe, we also believe in the eventual death of our dreams. We believe in the eventual death of good that is around us. We believe in the eventual death of our careers, of all the good moments that we gather in this life. We know that at some point, at some time, those moments will come to an end. So we know about death as well. It certainly isn't our favorite part of the story, but it is part of the story. It is part of our story. And I've been to a lot of funerals. We go to the cemetery where we stand around in a circle and we pray and where people weep and, and where there is a fresh headstone that is laid down. I've been to a lot of funerals and you've been to a lot of of funerals. Some were for people who lived long and faithful lives. Others were for people whose lives were cut way too short and who left people who depended on them in some form or another. I've been to a lot of funerals. And you've been to a lot of funerals where people speak in broken sentences between sobs between their weeping, between their pausing, as if they're trying to explain something, as if there's something more that needs to be said, but it just can't seem to come out of their mouths. Something that we want to say to the one that we're lying to rest. Something we want to say more to the person that has died. We know about death. We know all about death. The Scripture tells us this morning that at the time there was a strong earthquake and an angel of the Lord from heaven went to the tomb and rolled the stone away from the entrance and then he sat on top of that stone. Why did the angel move the stone? For whom did the angel move the stone from the entrance to the tomb? Was it for Jesus? Was it for Jesus so Jesus could get out of the tomb? Is that why the stone was removed by the angel? I mean, I've read this Scripture a hundred times and I just assumed that. I just assumed that the angel moved the stone so Jesus could come out. But think about it. Did the stone have to be removed in order for Jesus to exit the tomb? Did God need to have some help in order to raise Jesus from the dead? Was God so weak that He had to wait until the angel removed the stone from the entrance to the tomb? Hey, could somebody out there move this rock so I can get out? No, that's not what happened. That's not it at all. 
The text gives the impression that Jesus was already out when the stone was removed. Nowhere do the gospel say that the angel moved the stone for Jesus. So for whom then was the stone removed? The stone was removed from the entrance of the tomb for those two Marys that had gathered there who knew all about death. That is for whom the stone was removed, the two Marys. And you know what? That stone was removed for you. That stone was removed for you. You who know an awful lot about death as well. The second end of Easter, the second foundational truth of Easter is that on the third day, a power prevailed that was beyond all understanding and the stone is removed for us to enter into that power. The stone was removed for you to enter into that power. The stone was removed for me to enter into that power that prevailed on the third day. You know what? We're all moved by power, aren't we? We like signs of power. You like signs of power. I like signs of power. A power home run hit in baseball. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? What about like a powerful slam dunk in basketball? That's a great thing, huh? What about a power tackle or a power run or a power block in football? How about a powerful organ swell on Easter Sunday or a powerful Easter anthem? We like power. We like power. I was watching the Today Show. Maybe some of you saw this, but on the Today Show they were videoing this woman who was trying to raise money for charity. And in order for her to receive the money, she had to pull an 18 wheel semi trailer a 40 ton semi trailer so they were so they were videotaping her do you remember seeing that on the today show a couple weeks ago i mean you can imagine the scene when that woman got up in the morning and was talking to her husband brushing her teeth and her husband turned to her hey honey what are you going to do today she like oh i thought i'd go on national tv and, and try to pull a 40 ton semi trailer all right, sweetie, well, you have a good day then. I'll talk to you later. We like power. We like power. Have you ever seen on TV what they call the world's strongest man competition? I mean, these guys do all kinds of incredible things. There are three or 400 pound men. They're trying to demonstrate that they are the world's most powerful man. And I was in one of those contests at one time. And let me tell you, it is a rigorous competition. I'll tell you, it's tough. We like power, though. We like power. But you know that the world has never seen a power like it saw in this man Jesus. The world has never seen a power like this. People would flock to him because they saw him heal with a touch. They saw blind people who could see again. They saw lame people who could walk again. They saw him touch others and they were made well, that was the power that this Jesus had. And they saw him defy authority. And they had never seen a raw power like this. And when he stretched out his arms and when he hung on the cross, they thought that they were seeing weakness. But they were not seeing weakness. They were seeing power. They were seeing power that had never, ever been displayed in such a way before in their lives. It was a power that prevailed they were seeing a power of God like it had never been displayed before in the world. And on the third day, on the third day there was power. Not the kind of power that lorded over people. This is a power, a power, Scripture says, is made perfect in weakness. Perfect in weakness. There was this power that prevailed on the third day. I've been to a lot of funerals. You've been to a lot of funerals, and I've never yet seen a person sit up. I've never yet seen a person being raised from the dead. But you know what? I believe in this power of God, this perfect power of God that is prevailing. I believe in this power 
that is prevailing, this power of the resurrection. I believe in the power of the resurrection because I believe God still has that power and that power is still prevailing in your life and in my life. This perfect power that prevails, this perfect power that prevails to reach out to touch us when we are in need of healing, this perfect power that speaks to us and for us when we are vulnerable, this perfect power to strengthen us when we are weak, to bring us peace when our souls are struggling, this perfect power to give us to one another when we are lonely and when we need each other. I believe in this perfect power that is still prevailing. I don't know about you, but I believe in this power. Now, we're Lutherans, and when we are, you know, kind of bored and out of our, you know, we're just kind of, you know, we, we, we look a lot like this when we're bored. And when we're really excited and we're really gung-ho about something, we look like this. <laughs> but just so there's no confusion out here, this perfect power that is prevailing is good news. Is there any confusion about that? This is good news. The Easter hope for you and for me and this power that is found in you and me is good news. And in this power, you and I, the power of the resurrection, in this power, you and I will rise because we have this power that is made perfect in weakness. We are called to rise up. We are called to stand up in this power. We are called to rise up and to stand up for those who are hungry. We are called to rise up and stand up for those who are vulnerable. We are called to rise up and stand up for those who are forlorn. We are called to rise up and stand up for those who are broken. And I'm just going to keep going until you finally get it. We are called to rise up and stand up for all the people in the world because this perfect power that prevails is found in you and it is found in me. And this, my friends is the end of Easter. This, my friends, is the purpose of Easter. So rise up. Jesus is risen. Rise up and stand up. Hallelujah.